Okay, now we're recording. Okay, welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we're continuing our Brihat Bhagavatam Rita reading. And um, interesting point that we're discussing at the moment, although it's all interesting. But specifically, we're speaking about danya, humility. And let's just think in the context also, we were uh, also reading and speaking about um, the principle of developing uh, natural attraction for Krishna. Yeah. So this is the um, interesting part of the story of Gopal Kumar. So he was quite elevated from uh, one perspective. He wasn't educated in the principles of spiritual development as such. So now he is learning that to fully... Uh, in, in in order to become fully qualified. So he's hearing principles of Bhagavatam. So he's come back, as far as I can remember, he's come back down to earth. And he's attending the Bhagavatam class in the temple every day at <laughs> 7.30. <laughs> All right. You can see the screen, everyone? Yeah. Two, two, two. Okay, Mavasat, so you have your hand. Hari Ram, Hari Ram, 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 Hari Hari. Okay, Hari Krishna. So here we begin. Number 222. Two, two. Yeah. yeah, text 222. Two, two. Yeah. Wise men define Dhanya as the state in which one always thinks oneself exceptionally incapable and low, even when endowed with all excellences. Commentary. Narada's own definition of Dhanya distinguishes his use of the word from other possible meanings such as poverty becoming selfless by not accepting charity and becoming free from ego egotism. Someone might say that the quality of thinking oneself very fallen, one second, oh, sorry. Um, very fallen may, may also be seen in the person who are similarly lazy or those who abandon auspicious work or indulge in sinful acts. Therefore, Narada specifies that one who actually has Dainya is endowed with all good qualities. For instance, such a person observes positive and negative regulations. He is free of false ego and he has a healthy fear of material life. Further some, though Narada doesn't say so, transcendental Dainya is a state of extreme agitation that can lead to tears and other ecstatic outbreaks. Okay, so sometimes we get a free... Humility, let's use the words humility as opposed to danya. Sometimes you see that in even materialistic persons. Yeah, they, um, which is good in one sense, they uh, exhibit some aspects of humility. Of course, most will be very prideful, but sometimes you can be surprised um, persons. But it's not actual, but they may be acting in sinful ways as well. So that's not actually humility as defined here. Yeah. So it means someone who observes yama and the yama positive and negative regulations is free of full ego. <laughs> he has a fear of material life. Yeah. Sometimes you meet someone on the street, isn't it? You meet, well, you might not meet them, but you see persons on the street and they're begging. <laughs> and some of them can be seen, they're quite can be so quite intense sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes they're so one man, he was actually, he had his head on the pavement and his hands in the air with a sign. So that takes a certain level of desperation or humility. Anyway, Hare Krishna. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. An intelligent person should carefully cultivate speech, behavior, and thinking that fix him in utter humility, and anything that stands in the way of it, he should avoid. Okay. Text 224. 
Dainya at its most exalted comes forth when prema, pure love of God, reaches full maturity as it did in the women of Gokula when they were separated from Krishna. Commentary. Ordinary dainya can be developed by human effort, but there is also a type of dainya beyond the mundane that comes from receiving the Supreme Lord's favor. The word tu in this verse contrasts these distinct kinds of dainya. Almost everyone in the material world is separated from Krishna, but most people never experience dainya because oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, because they have no prema. Therefore, they can never become free from suffering and attain true happiness. To achieve transcendental dhanya, one must learn to love Krishna in the mood felt by the gopis, led by Sri Radha, when Krishna left them to go to Mathura. We can understand from the example of the gopis, Virahabhav, their feelings of love in separation, that this special dhanya arises only when by sweetness, only when by Sri Krishna's exceptional mercy, a devotee who has realized Krishna's sweetness develops extraordinary prema in his heart in the mood of separation. As prema appears in degrees of excellence, so does dainya. Okay, so um, right, um, this verse is quite something to meditate upon as well, two through three. So I think that was asked last week, how to cultivate humility. And we mentioned about that. It is a cultivation. And it said here, the word is used. So it means when you just like if you cultivate a seed, or if you cultivate a plant at home, you have to give it attention. So speech, so humility in speech, in behavior and thinking, that may be the more difficult one. Yeah. To actually, in your inner world, you are thinking yourself to be below all other Vaishnavas. We can say like that externally in a formal setting. Oh, you are all Prabhu, but wherever we really in that inner world are situated in that, that I am so low, no one is so advanced, you know. All right. So it's a practice. It's called it's called sadhana. It's a practice. And then more, this is um, humility manifest at stages of perfection. So if anyone's... Um, if anyone here is uh, cultivating the Raghunu with sudden of, man, of being a Manjari, okay, anyone else <laughs> cultivating man, uh, Manjari Bhav, then it's going to be in your favor to cultivate humility because that is the mood of the gopis led by Radha. So that's an attribute specifically of the gopis and all the residents of Vandavan actually. But here, Sanat Goswami is focusing on the. Um, and it's got a mute, do some muting here. Hare Krishna. He's focusing on the gopis here. Yeah, that's one of the qualities of Radha, that she is uh, the personification by dint of her prema, the personification of humility. Yeah. What's that? I had that verse. Um, Although her love is so good, there's one verse, so all glories to Radha's love for Krishna. I'm just paraphrasing. Although her love is so great, it's so great, and this is the greatest, and it's ever increasing, it is devoid of pride. And although her love is also is pure, it is beset with duplicity. I want to be set with duplicity. In their loving affairs, often there's some contention between Radha and Krishna. Actually, there's often quite a lot of divine contention between Radha and Krishna, as we know. You know, sometimes Krishna cannot make the appointment in uh, meeting Radha. So, and sometimes Radha has to be quite um, not straightforward with Krishna. <laughs> So although it's pure, it's it's um, full of it's full of duplicity. And though it's great, it is endowed with great humility. So the gopis, um, when she, when she's acting, when she's interacting with the um, with her manjaris and with the other gopis, she sees and she interacts in a very 
in a very with, with, with great humility and whenever she's glorified by the other gopis in song or praise she becomes very bashful you know, she, she's very very bashful and and shy and when for instance one gopi may be speaking about her rendezvous with krishna again she becomes very shy she's very humble and even there's even when her manjaris are glorifying her then she like we do same as devotees do is when devotees may glorify us for one reason or another then we then we try then we do our best to offset that glorification Radha does the same thing when she's being glorified. Yeah, she, uh, although she is, obviously she's, she's the personification of all prema, of all love. It all flows from her. But her actual mood is, is great humility. I think one devote, you said that if, um, if we was by chance to meet or have darshan of Radha, she would think that you're doing better service than her, you know, to her Lord. If you're making garlands or cooking, she will glorify that and see you as being greater. So that's inconceivable <laughs> to us. You know, any comments or questions on this? I was can... so to achieve transcendental danya, one must learn to love Krishna in the mood felt by the gopis. All right, so there's some Raghunuga Sadhan for those of us qualified. Must learn to love Krishna in the mood felt by the gopis, led by Radha. Okay, so she's a teacher of humility. Sorry, I think did someone wanted to say something and I cut them off. Okay. Let's read 225. You can continue, Mother Sahajari. Okay, 225. When Dainya fully matures, Prema unfolds without limit. And so we see Dainya and Prema acting in a relationship and with each is both cause and effect. Commentary. If Prema is supposed to be the final result of devotional endeavors, how can Dainya be a consequence of Prema? In answer, yes, Prema is the final goal. But Dainya is not altogether different from Prema. Dainya is an integral component of Prema and both foster one another. It is a misunderstanding to think that because there is always another level of perfection to achieve, one can never reach the supreme goal of life. What the progressive development of Prema shows is not that there is no goal, but that in spiritual life there is endless variety. By pure love for the lotus feet of Sri Gopinath, the fruit one achieves is the attainment of Sri Goloka. By that attainment, the direct sight of Sri Gopinath, by that direct vision, his special mercy, by that mercy, the highest ecstasies of Virahabhav, and so on. This endless sequence is not a fault, but simply by the unfolding of spiritual variety. Even in Vaikuntha, what to speak of Goloka? The bliss of devotional service unfolds in an infinite variety that puts the happiness of liberation to shame. Hare Krishna. Okay, so we have to welcome a special guest. Dhruva Maharaj has just tuned in. Hare Krishna. Must be an auspicious alignment of planets. Must be an auspicious alignment of planets. <laughs> Hare Krishna, welcome. Hare Krishna. So, thank, thank you, Dandavat. Right, so this has been, um, I think we have mentioned this before, and it's come up a few times here, looking at this first here. Both nourish each other. So humility nourishes prema, and prema nourishes humility. Yeah. So that's why it's in very, also in the, in the Shishashtakam, isn't it? It's given as a principle. Yeah. Quick, what's that verse? Trinada peace and it china to Lord the peace. A mani dana, mani dina, kitana, soda. Yeah, so we have to cultivate this humility and then we'll advance in we'll advance in devotional service and advance in affection and love for Krishna. 
And then, as has been mentioned here, when actually one experiences affection and love for Krishna, then real danger is going to manifest. Yeah. So we have to kind of, um, I heard um, Keshav Maharaj often see, he said it in a class he gave here recently. Um, and I have to devote you say it before. It's quite interesting. Fake it before you make it. You heard that one? Where if you're not feeling yeah. humble, act humble. Yeah. We we have to understand the importance of developing humility. So even though our subtle body might be crying out and screaming, <laughs> we should want to subdue it by being humble and put in our hands. Sometimes we just have to take it and put, even if we're in the right so to speak, in certain situations, it may be easier just to put their hands together and say, sorry, Prabhu, sorry, Mataji. <laughs> yeah, we have to, it's always good to take the humble path, the uh, humble, yeah. It very, it's very good in spiritual life if we can do that. But it's not all, it's not always so easy. Uh, especially if we see ourselves to be in that, um, because there's many different situations we can find ourselves in. But right? if we see us, you know, we we might, according to our understanding, be in a right in a particular situation. But if in that situation we can fold our palms and say, "Please accept my apologies," even though we might be in the right. And the person's um, observe or the person's accusations is actually wrong. Okay, so is it, this is different circumstances, but I just speak in how we can help to develop this humility. In some cases we may also, without getting too psychological about this, even maybe sometimes where being humble means we. Speak up. That's another situation as well. Where actually humility means sometimes it may mean speaking up for ourselves. That's another circumstance. Yeah. Any questions on this point? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What circum under what circumstances we speak up and then still remain humble? Yeah, because it's a good question. What circumstances may there be? Well, they, it might be for the sake of service. It might be for the sake of another devotee's um, reputation. You know, you might be with senior devotees, for example, and so you're feeling you're feeling humble, but something might come up where. You, where it's needed for you to speak up about what you see is right, even though senior devotees may be there and maybe may be saying something different. So you could take two paths. You could keep quiet and let perhaps say wrong or a misunderstanding happen, or you can humbly speak up. Yeah. It might take Thank humility you. to actually do that. Yeah. Thank you. It's a very, um, it's a very, it can be very subtle, depending on the specific circumstances we're in. But the overall message from here we're getting is that we, as that verse said, let's just go back again. It's important. Um, an intelligent person should carefully cultivate speech, behavior, and thinking that fix him him or her in utter humility and anything that stands in the way of it he should avoid all right so it's quite it's quite an instruction just like Prabhupada said he's he, sometimes he was I think one uh, Mataji she was kind of complaining a bit about how she has to conduct herself when she's distributing books you know, she has to be quite forthright. She has to be quite 
you could say, quite demanding and kind of upfront to actually stop people and convince them to take a book. So she was asking Prabhupada about this. And then Prabhupada said, yes, for Krishna consciousness. I think there's a statement where he said we have to be like a lion in the chase. What was it? What's the other one? A lion in a chase and a... You don't know the other part of that and the lamb in the... Why is, why is there a snake and innocent oh. as a dog? No, 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 that's not the one. <laughs> in the chase, we should be like a lion. So when you're preaching, you may have to be a bit forthright, you know, and to actually stop people if you're doing book distribution. But we should be like a lamb at home. Yeah. So Papa also said, do you think that, you know, do you think it, me coming to the West, I had to be strong. I had to be forthcoming. Yeah. But, but that was Prabhupada's humility and actually following the orders of his spiritual master. That was actually being humble. I think we mentioned before, if, if Prabhupada had said, if his spiritual master, he got the instruction from, from Bhakti Siddhanta, Sadasati Thakur, and Prabhupada said, oh, I'm too fallen, Guru Maharaj, I cannot possibly follow that. <laughs> that, would be, that would be false humility. And some of his godbrothers said that because Bhakti Siddhanta gave the instruction to many. But, it's, but Prabhupada didn't say, no, sorry, I'm, no, I'm too fallen. I can't take up that mission. No, he said, no, he is, you know, he put, him, put himself forward as being in, incapable. But I have received this instruction on, on my head from the guru. So despite my disqualification, then I have to carry it out. That is real humility. Mm -hmm. yeah, not that, oh, I can't do it. Sorry. <laughs> you know, mm. I'm on a bit here. Rumble, um, is it in like a lion and out like a like a lamb? <laughs> just... like that. No, it's the, the first one is a lion in the chase oh. and a lamb at home. I think it's something like that. I've heard of it, but I can't think of it. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking this humility, we don't have to be like a doormat, you know, and we step um. you into, but you have to be firm in what you saying or doing, but say it in a humble way. Yeah, that's it. Humbly, but far, humble way. If you think something's not right, you say it, but you say it in a nicer way. Yeah, that's very well described, Mother Chandravali. That's it. If, so if we're situated in actual humility, then when we do have things to say, even if it might be correcting, or then it should be done in the mood of humility, of speech. I said that, and that verse said of speech, we should practice yeah. humble in our speech, even if it's to bring up a wrong about something or someone, if we're in that position. To actually do that, you know. I was thinking that um, if, um, like, uh, if you just um, don't want to say, don't want to mean you don't even say anything. You just come along, do your service, and you know, not really get much involved. Does yeah. that is that being humble or is that being? Uh, Might be again. It I don't depend. I mean, you, it very much depends on the circumstances. Very much depends on the circumstances that you are in and uh, who is actually is. So in some cases, that might be, you know, someone might come to do service, they say this or they see this and they see that. So their path of humility would be to perhaps keep quiet. And if it's really gnawing at them, then better speak to someone in authority mm. rather than kind of throwing instructions and criticisms everywhere, left, right, and center, you know. Better say, come, do one service humbly. If one sees something amiss, we have to think carefully of how we address it and if we address it. So, it might, so the path of humility there might be 
just to speak at some other stage, at some other point, to someone in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it yeah. Up. Rather than we go in and every time we see something or we, or we go to a temple, wherever it might be, you know, say if you're a guest at a temple, you know, um, New Mayapur or somewhere like that, and you're criticizing, <laughs> you see things which are not right, it might not be a good for, it might be a not good symptom. Anyway, Hare Krishna. All right, let's read another verse, shall we? Anyone else like to read out there? There's quite a few devotees with us today. Any readers? I could read if, it's the, if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. It's perfectly okay. 226. Text 226. Dear brother, those who know the essence of prema recognize its presence when the melting of devotee's heart gives rise to trembling and other such outward signs. Commentary. This uh, statement settled a possible doubt over the nature of prema. Since prema develops from feelings of utter hopelessness, dainya, dainya, is prema a mood of uh, richness? It's a good yeah. question to ask, isn't it? Is it? Wretchedness, go on. Or since prema is considered the greatest of all goals, it is a special mood of bliss that comes from getting free from all cause causes of wretchedness. According to Narada, only those who have realizing realized prema can distribute distinguish its real nature. The essence of prema <clears throat> cannot be defined in mere words. At best, it can be recognized by, by its secondary characteristic, Tatashta Lakshana. Thus, we can understand the presence of Prema by the external symptoms like trembling, floods of tears, and standing erects of the bodily hair. Something of the heart, Chita, chitta Drata, also <laughs> counts as a... Mm -hmm. Bless you. Yeah, as thank an you so much. Because it is knowledgeable by the mind even though it is also said to be internal because it is not a directly vi visible object. Mm. Okay. Any questions about this here? What, what does wretchedness mean? Wretchedness? Yeah, in so, terms of... Let me just see. Well, from my top of my mind, it, you're feeling useless, you're feeling pathetic, you're feeling incapable, you're feeling like a wretch, cause a wretchedness, you know? Let me just look up in the dictionary. Wrecked building, it's like a broken building, something No, that's, a, that's another word, that's called wrecked. This is wretchedness. So in a, a person in a very unhappy or unfortunate state, I felt so wretched because I thought I might never see you again. A poor quality, very, very bad wretchedness. Is that your understanding, Dhruva Guru? Wretchedness? Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. Or oh, since Prema is considered the greatest of all goals, so since Prema develops from feelings of utter um, helplessness. Dania, is Prema a mood of wretchedness? Or since Prema is considered the greatest of all goals, is it a special mood of bliss that comes from getting free from all causes of wretchedness? Well, that's the question. So what's the answer? What do you think, Marie Prabhu? I don't know. That um, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> the answer is here in the rest of the purple. I think I'm trying to figure out what it is. So it's real nature of prema. We're familiar with these two words, tatashta and sarup lakshan. Devotees are not so sarup lakshan is the fundamental underlying cause and then there's symptoms that manifest from that to touch the lakshan yeah so for instance one so love of god prema 
affection for Krishna in the Pacific mellow is sarup, then that will manifest to Tasha Suprema. It has its manifestations so by external symptoms. Yeah. So these are symptoms that are uncontrollable because generally devotees will want to, they generally hide their ecstatic symptoms, but there's levels of prema where sometimes it becomes, one is controlled by those symptoms and one cannot control the symptoms. So this is what this here is described. Trembling, floods of tears and standing erect of bodily hair and softening of the heart. So, then this is... I think someone who recognizes... Sorry? You got cut off at the end. I think someone who can identify... Yeah, I didn't. I stopped saying something you wanted to continue. So someone who knows to identify will know if you fake it or you don't. Someone who already experiences. Yeah, someone, yeah. Yeah, good point. someone who has prema can see for those who are sahajiyas. That's yeah. those who are purposely theoretic, uh, theoretically, you know, fieta are putting on the external symptoms. But those who really have love for Krishna, they are not to be fooled. Yeah. So anyway, I think the answer is here. It's uh, this one. It is a special mood of bliss that comes from getting free of all causes of wretchedness. Yeah. Anyway, let's read on. We might learn more if we read. <laughs> Hare Krishna. All right. You'd like to read 227? Yes, please. Text two to seven. For those who give prema, the blazing those who have prema. For those who have prema. Those who have prema, the blazing conflagration of their agony is like the nectarian water of the Yamuna, and yet like the burning flame of a fire. To them poison is like nectar, and nectar like poison. Death is happiness and life, but an expansion of misery. Commentary. In the intoxication of prema. Sources of pleasure seem like those of pain, and vice versa. In other words, the difference between pleasure and pain becomes blurred. Things one should accept as auspicious and beneficial one ab abhors, because they remind one of the very beloved one is trying to forget. And things that helps one forget one beloved one welcomes as auspiciousness. Yeah, so it's difficult to understand, like yeah, a bit. Yeah, it is difficult. Everything right. prema has its own laws, has its own laws which cannot be really reconciled with, with, on the material platform. So I'm just trying to find a. I don't know what is this word abhors. Some words I don't know. It means to be indifferent or means that, as far as I know, let's have a look again. Look up a board. It means to shun. Um, regard, yeah, regard. regard as disgust and hatred. He abhorred. Yeah, abhorred. No. Mm. And there was one more word somewhere. Very be loud or what is that? Very yeah. un... There was another word which I didn't understand in the verse or commentary. Yeah, in another verse. Suspicious. No, abhors. I think it was only the yeah. There's not other one. Yeah. So yeah, it has its own uh, own specific laws and it, it kind of reverses what we understand to be normal so in other words um if you was if you was to see radharani when krishna left for mathura you would be horrified at her soyful 
suffering state. Yeah. But really, she's in the highest possible ecstasy. <laughs> but externally, one will be horrified. Just like that's why it was so that's when 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 Udava, he went to Raj, when he met the gopis, he com became complete when he met the residents of Raj, he became completely bewildered. He's never seen such an exhibition of intense emotion. Now he's he's a very advanced devotee. He has prema for Krishna. And he has associates in Dwarka, Mathura, etc. And they're all devotees of Krishna. And they become ecstatic when Krishna, when they see Krishna, for example. But when he went to Raj, he's never seen anything like this. Even to the point of, what is it, un, un mother, And become mad. Especially when he saw Radharani speaking to the bumblebee. You know that part where she's speaking to the bumblebee? So, so if you was to see someone speaking to a bumblebee, next time you go to Regent's Park and you see someone speaking to a bumblebee and crying and blaming a bumblebee, what would you conclude? He's in a different world. No, this person's mad. This person's on LSD. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this person must be crazy. Isn't it? If you see someone speaking to an inanimate object or bee and having a conversation with a bee, very intense conversation. And the conversation that Radu Rani has with the bee, I think at one point she's, she's speaking to the bee and obviously the bee's not replying. So then she said, considers that that's okay. So you're indifferent to me, are you? <laughs> so you're being indifferent to me, are you? Mm -hmm. So this is all so externally, it seems like madness, but it's the highest point of sanity. You see? So it has these prima <laughs> from the material perspective, it kind of has it. It's difficult to difficult to understand it. Now I'm trying to find one quote I had. I really want to find it because it's quite on this point. I might. Um, you understand? A bit. Yeah. But it makes sense. Yeah. It, it, it does make, make sense. sense. It makes sense that 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 we can't make sense of prima. It makes sense. Some word is coming to my mind, like I can think to myself, talk to myself, but how sick I am, but we are so, I'm so far away to experience even yeah. a fraction of what is discussed. Okay, I'm not going to find what I'm looking for. I should stop trying to find it. I was just wasting time. Um, no, I think I've, 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 I've just found it. Okay. Okay. All right, so this is from um, a book called The Prima Samput. Um, Shivaram, he's all in his Shila Shivaram, so I'm Shivaram Swami Maharaj, includes this in one book of his called Krishna Sangati, I think. Okay. Prima is so great that learned scholars cannot understand it. What to speak of others who claim to know it? One who attempts to instruct an inquisitive person by by measuring prema or by comparing it to anything else has failed to comprehend prema on the hears such a teacher is uh, misled now this prema some put this is radharani teaching krishna about prema <laughs> it's a very interesting story the uh, the alila is is that krishna disguises himself as a demigoddess I won't tell the whole it take too long, but she described he describes him he disguises himself as a demigoddess. And she's there in Vraj, Krishna disguised as a demigoddess in Vraj, and she and, and the gopis come across her. Now she's very beautiful, 
She's very enchanting because it's Krishna in disguise as a demigoddess, but she's very, but um, but uh, she won't speak, and her head is pointed to the ground. But there's a wonderful effulgence about her, and Radharani and the gopis are very attracted to her, Krishna, but they don't know it's Krishna. Krishna's dressed as a feminine, you know, as a demigoddess. Then eventually they they get her to start speaking and they're asking, why are you so miserable? Is it because your lover has left you? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? And she still won't speak. Then eventually she starts speaking and she reveals that the reason she's so quiet and she's so sorrowful is that she's feeling sorry for Radharani because she's been watching the pastimes. And she sees how Krishna, how sometimes Krishna doesn't, or he may not, uh, he may not come to their rendezvous. And he sees how much Radharani suffers. And this happens again and again. So she's questioning, Raj, she questions Radha's love for Krishna. How is it that you still love such a person as this person, Krishna? I've seen he does this, he does that, he does this, he does that. So how is it? So then Radharani is called Prema Samput. And then she reveals the jewels of her Prema for Krishna. And Krishna's listening, described as a demigoddess, as he's criticizing himself you follow the story yeah that's called prema samput and this is part of what she's saying to krishna so she says um such an exchange is but teaching for prema disappears both before the discriminate and the indiscriminate but that pure-hearted soul whose mind is imbued with affectionate attachment free from all speculation, alone sits upon the throne of natural love. That's right. deep. Um, let me read this as well. The miseries of this world resulting from present and future happiness, family affairs, political intrigues, bodily pains, and unrequited love appear as insurmountable as Mount Meru. They are, however, conquered effortlessly, by supremely powerful prema. As a lion feeds on elephants, prema removes all obstacles in its path, only to be nourished by those very obstacles. You follow that? So for okay. someone in prema, obstacles enhance the prema. Give more prema. Yeah, it enhances it. Proud of its bodily luster, Amid immeasurable strength, a lion sleeps peacefully, unmindful of nearby dogs. <clears throat> Likewise, Prema, radiating imperishable affection and decorated with a wounded pride, thrives without being disturbed by material distress. A lamp shines brighter in the darkness, so the glory of Prema shines brighter in material affliction. So this is Radharani's answers to Krishna dis disguised as a demigoddess. And she's describing all those difficulties that she goes through. It's all, it, all, it, just, in, it just enhances her love for Krishna. Okay? Hare Krishna. So the more we accept our challenges and hardships and everything, the more we will actually perceive and develop love. Yeah, so let's bring it down to our level. Okay, let's bring it down to our, how can we relate to that? Yes, this is the idea. Prabhupada said that one should unhesitatingly accept all reversals as Krishna's mercy. Unhesitatingly accept all reversals as Krishna's mercy. I think we mentioned that yesterday. I haven't got around that one yet. I can't. I breathe. Okay. Hare Krishna. 
Should we read a bit more? Yes, Hare Krishna. Two to eight. Any comments or questions about that? If anyone has a book, if you have one of Shivaram Swami Maharaj's books, you can find that conversation. Prema Samput. Um, I think it's in Krishna Sangati or na, or na Pariyaham. It's by Vishnu Chakra. Isn't it also in the second volume of? Yeah, um, if you love Yeah, it's there. It's there, yeah. Maraj also puts it there. If you love Manjali, volume two by Shivaram Swami. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. Anyway, I can't but help tell the end of that story where, um, so Krishna says, okay, so if you can really control Krishna, and if you two are non-different from each other, then, 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 then you tell me, where is Krishna now? Of course, sitting in front of Radharani, demigoddess. You know, so she's so this demigoddess Krishna is challenging Radha. And then he says, Then, okay, so I will only accept your words if you can actually bring Krishna here now. <laughs> this is Krishna saying this, disguised the demigod to Radharani. So so Radharani goes into her, she closes her eyes and she goes in, she holds, puts her hand into her eyes like a mystic yogi. She goes into deep meditation, meditating on Krishna. And at that point, Krishna cannot help himself. Seeing her purity and the seeing her love, then he sheds his demigoddess, you know, he sheds his demigoddess disguise and he kisses Radharani on the cheek. Remember, she's got oh, her eyes closed really? and she's meditating on Krishna. And then she feels Krishna's embrace and she feels Krishna. Uh, in, and so she, she's still got her eyes closed. She goes into great ecstasy as Mahabhav ecstasy. Uh, and then what happens then? then? Then Krishna disappears from the scene. And then Radharani opens her eyes and a demigoddess is gone. And uh, she's feeling this, ex she, she felt Krishna's presence, but she can't see Krishna anywhere. Anyway, that's this past time, Prima Samput. Okay, Hare Krishna. Go ahead. Should I read yeah, two, yeah. two. Thank you for sharing. Wonderful. Wow. Yes, wonderful. Text two to eight. Indeed, <laughs> because one cannot clearly tell between coming together with the object of Prema and being separated from it. Prema is full of both the greatest ecstasy and the worst anguish. Commentary. A devotee under the influence of Prema loses the power to discriminate between ecstasy and misery. For example, in the final chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, 10 Kanto, we find that Krishna's queens, after enjoying water sports with Krishna, lamented the pain of their separation from him, even though he was still present with them with them. The nature of bhakti is such that it generates all varieties of emotions, especially, especially as it develops towards its extreme limits. Even in ordinary life, things can take, things taken to their extreme can seem to change into their opposites. The coldest ice may feel hot to the touch like fire. Devotees advance in prema enjoy the company of a uh, Personalities of God, of the personality of God, the embodiment of the supreme bliss. They delight in the special joy derived from taking part in His wonderful pastimes. But by the extraordinary nature of bhakti, in the very midst of that enjoyment, appear the pain of separation, the ecstasy of separation. Indeed, it is the ripe fruit of fully developed prema, and is one of its essential components. Just as a hunger is in an essential part of the complete engine of eating. However, it may appear superficially, the happiness of prema in separation is the rare, rarest treasure. In previous chapter of uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, this has already been discussed, and in the last two chapters, it will be cl classified still further. Clarified, still further. Okay. So, any comments or questions here? Uh, for your information, this where sometimes Krishna is present 
and the love of Radha, sometimes it's as if she thinks that Krishna is not present. That's called prema vai, prema vai chitya. But even though Krishna is by her side, in the ecstasy of prema, she thinks Krishna has left. She starts shedding tears and goes into this great agony of separation where Krishna is sitting right next to her. You know, so then Krishna is seeing her ecstatic love for him, then Krishna starts shedding tears and Radharani shedding tears. And it, Prema Sarova, there's one place called Prema Sarova where such a pastime happened and it created a lake which is there in Raj, Prema Sarova. It's called yeah, where. Okay, and that's there's a pastime of that. That's in the Venu Gita. There's a pastime like that, where Radharani and Krishna are together, and uh, she thinks Krishna has gone, and she goes into great ecstasy of separation. Yeah. All right, uh, let's. We've got a precious four minutes. Let's see. If we can read another verse. If any comments or questions? Please feel free to ask. Okay. Perhaps I can have a read of this one. Okay. Um, when when prema matures, one inevitably acts from time to time in ways of an utter madman. Uh -huh. As without such prema, not even the nine kinds of devotional service to Lord Mukunda can bring real happiness. All right. So we have the nine kinds of service, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smara, Parasevanam, etc. Commentary. The purpose of devotional service is regulative practice. In regulative practice, Vaidhi, is to bring one to the stage of prema. Only by realizing the fullness of prema can one truly become happy. The symptoms of this prema are obvious and altogether different from those of any kinds of success. So this is well-known verse, evam vrata sri priya nama kritya chata anurag udita chita utai hasati ato rodita ruti gayati unmarata mitchale loka bhaya. By chanting the holy name of the Supreme Lord, one comes to the stage of love of Godhead. Okay, so it's simple as that, okay? By chanting the holy name, you come to the state of love of Godhead. Then a devotee is fixed in his vow as an eternal servant of the Lord and become, and he gradually becomes very much attached to a particular name and form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As his heart melts with ecstatic love, he laughs very loudly or cries or shouts. And sometimes he sings and dances like a madman. For he's indifferent to public opinion. Okay, even Bharata. Any questions on that or comments? Yeah, sometimes in, it's a fine line. Sometimes in Kirtan, devotees get quite ecstatic. We have a Mahavishnu Swami, <laughs> he becomes quite ecstatic dancing you could say like a madman and encouraging everyone else to do the same yeah so from time to time we might see that in our senior devotees during kirtan of course it depends on their nature some may generally so these are the signs of great attachment and love for krishna prema become indifferent to public opinion any questions about that mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we should, it's sometimes, uh, how can we explain that sometimes um, seeing the ecstatic manifestations of senior devotees, and sometimes we may want to try and imitate that. You know, so we should be a bit careful. It's a fine line, you know. Generally, devotees will, when they feel ecstasy, 
they will dance and shout very, you know, they will dance without indifferent public opinion. So it's a fine line. Because sometimes one will do that just for entertainment, you know, rather than it being a manifestation of ecstatic love. Sometimes devotees get bored in kirtan. <laughs> so to living it up, they do something wacky. <laughs> In one sense, it does, but you know, it's a fine line. You understand what I'm saying? It's a fine line where the kirtan becomes just a source of entertainment for for ourselves, rather than for the pleasure of Krishna. Now, the idea is that these ecstatic devotees, there's things which are being realized in the heart, which makes them ecstatic. Sometimes we may see such ecstatic devotees and. We kind of just follow the externals, and it becomes like uh, sometimes the kirtan becomes like a whole joking affair. Who can be the most mad? <laughs> you know? I mean, in one sense, I guess the Lord must like it. At least everyone's chanting the holy name, you know. So that's not all bad. But the real thing is when we actually experience ecstasy and we, you know, a prema of you know. Anyway, Krishna, I'm mumbling on a bit. Any questions or comments here? All right, so we're Paul's here then, and we continue next week with verse, let's note this down, 230, okay? Okay, thank you devotees for joining us today. We had many devotees with us. We had, well, 12, we hit 12 devotees join us. Thank you for joining us, and uh, please join us for this wonderful unfolding of the story of Gopal Kumar. Now he's preparing to go to Vrind he's, he's preparing to go to Vrindavan. And we're going to hear at some point he's actually going there and meeting Krishna. So Sadi Krishna. All right. Thank you everyone. Jai Shala Baba.